Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining this special program this evening. I am going to ask as we get ready to go forward that you kindly mute all of your devices. Um, we'll be having questions toward the end of the program this evening. And so if you'll please oblige those who are here by just muting everywhere so that everyone can hear what's being presented uh, clearly and in an undisturbed manner. It is now 7.30 p.m. Tuesday, January 16. I appreciate your coming on here this evening from different points across the South Atlantic Conference. And from what I'm seeing here on the screen, we have people joining us from places in Jamaica and perhaps other places as well. I'd like to welcome you all and I greet you in the name of Jesus. As we get ready to begin this evening, shall we pause for a word of prayer? Father, now as we come, we thank you so very much for your loving kindness and your tender mercies toward us. We praise you for the small part that you have allowed us to have in the finishing of the gospel of salvation to all men. And we pray that you will now come into our hearts and guide us, instruct us, we pray, as we study, as we learn how to make a strategic plan for our local congregation so that we can do even better work for you where we are in Jesus name, amen. All right, so welcome again. Um, I am Dr. Everton A. Ennis. I am the General Vice President for the South Atlantic Conference of Seventh-day Adventists located here in the Atlanta area in Georgia. And I see that I have uh, people on from Stony Hill, Seventh-day Adventist Church, and perhaps other places mm -hmm. in Jamaica. I know some of the pastors and conference leaders there in Jamaica and the Bahamas, Turks and Caicos, um, did receive the information and might have circulated that to you, and I welcome you here this evening. We're going to try to move as expeditiously as possible, and for that reason, I'm asking that you record your questions and comments that you have and there will be a time toward the end of the program that you'll be given the opportunity to ask those questions. I'll be happy to double back if I need to clarify some things and shed some light on whatever it is that you have questions on. Uh, Sister Barbara Williamson, I'm going to ask you to mute, please. Go ahead and mute, Sister Barbara. Thank you so very much. Much appreciated. All right. So um, we're doing this program this evening. Uh, primarily for the South Atlantic Conference churches and church board members. And we decided to open it up to whoever would like to join. But as I mentioned before, I see people here from Jamaica on the call right now. Now, uh, why are we doing this? I'm glad you asked that question. Sometimes in our journey as church officers, pastors, church board members, we, we ask the question, what shall we do? Um, what ministry shall we offer? What should we be doing in our communities? what's working, what's not working. And we have not sometimes been sure as to how we should go about answering this question. I'm proposing this evening that the strategic planning process is a great way to help us unearth realities and facts on the ground where you are so that you're in a better position to know what should you be doing, how should you be doing it, who should be doing it, and can you even get it done? And so thank you again for coming on here this evening. Now, please also bear with me at the different points in our presentation, my voice is gonna be strained. I'm going through this coughing spell. Some of you um, I've, I've interacted with, you've told me you've had it too. Going into my second week, no, I don't have COVID, thank God, but this thing has a grip on me. So whenever I speak, there's an urge to wanna cough. So from time to time, I will mute and you'll see me do this on the screen. I'll not shut the video down in the interest of time, but I may quickly mute my microphone so that I could quickly cough and move on. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and launch our screen so that uh, we can get started in earnest. I'm gonna share the screen uh, with you so that we can we can follow along with what I'm presenting here this evening. And of course, of course. Uh, 
this is called strategic planning basic training and specifically this is for the local church this is for the local church all right so we're going to cover uh, several important topics this evening in this presentation uh, we're going to look at things like why strategic planning we're going to talk about the sources of information for effective strategic planning where do we find our stuff that will be helpful to us in the process we're going to talk about a concept called the SWOT analysis uh, which is a key component of doing any kind of strategic planning. We're going to go into that really in depth. We're going to look at data analysis and information grouping. Don't let these terminologies scare you, by the way. I'm going to break this thing down real simple for you this evening. And by the time we're done with the presentation, I'm going to be putting a, a PDF of this presentation in the chat so that you can download it on your end and use it for your own purposes, all right? So don't worry about taking a bunch of notes right now. Focus on listening and maybe writing your questions down that you'll answer, uh, you'll be able to ask in the Q&A section. We're gonna talk about developing strategic objectives. What does that mean? And how is that beneficial to this process? And then we're gonna talk a bit about writing a SMART strategic plan. SMART is an acronym. We're gonna unpack that when we come to it. And then we're gonna close out by looking at how we implement and the importance of evaluating our strategic plan as we roll that out to make sure that we're hitting our benchmarks, uh, benchmarks and accomplishing the goals and objectives that we're setting out um, to accomplish in our local church. All right, so... Um, I think that wasn't on the screen first when I was talking. I need to make sure that what I'm saying, you're seeing on the screen. So I apologize for that. Again, don't worry about taking notes. I'm going to send you a PDF. Was someone trying to hail me just now? All right. So let's go right into why strategic planning. Why do we need to do strategic planning? Let me say from the onset, that I don't know how to pastor a church without a strategic plan. I am addicted to strategic planning because it is so beneficial. It is so powerful. Um, God has blessed me over 23 years of ministry. Um, when I was in full-time pastoral ministry, now I'm in the conference office um, serving the wider yeah. field. But I the take the light. Uh, yes. Please, please, please mute. Please mute your, your, um, your microphone. Please mute your microphone. Okay, Sister Barbara. Sister Barbara Williamson. Yes, sir, that's not me. I know, I know. Are you on a computer? I'm on a tablet. Okay, can you see everybody who's on the Zoom? Uh, yes. Okay, I'm going to give you co-host is that all right i'm going to ask you to be my policeman for tonight okay so when folk are not muting their stuff you just look at, look for them for me please and mute them okay we do all right i'm making you co-host now all right thank you so much okay great all right so there are three broad reasons why strategic planning is important for a local church. Number one, without a plan, without a definite uh, plan that the members know about, there is no clear sense of direction as to where we're going as a church. I believe that the local church, the members need to know that we have a vision, we have a plan, we're aiming for somewhere. Let me tell you why this is important, because... Mm -hmm. Churches that are not united around a central mission tend to be churches that fall apart with conflict. Satan finds work for idle hands to do. And we know from experience that working churches don't fight and fighting churches don't work. It's kind of hard to find the time to work and fight at the same time. And so I prefer for my churches to work. And so that means we always have something going on. The second reason is uh, the strategic planning process enables us to examine facts and realities that are affecting our church mission. What are the facts on the ground? What are the realities that we're dealing with both internally and externally as we seek to move the cause of God forward 
because he has given us, he has commissioned us to carry out a responsibility. The long shot of that is to seek and save the lost. But along the way, as we're doing that, there are so many other component parts to that reality, to that mission that we have to take care of, such as community engagement. And what does that look like? We talk about that a little bit in this program. Then, of course, the third reason for strategic planning is it provides, as was uh, suggested before, a unifying and motivational influence for local church missions. It's a good way to galvanize the energies, the interest, and, and the attention of the members to point everybody in the same direction. So strategic planning is critical and is powerful for these very reasons. Now let's talk about sources of information. Where do we find the information that we use to do strategic planning, especially if the strategic plan is going to be an effective one? Where can we look for that kind of information? One of the places that we want to first look, if I'm a consultant, and by the way, we're doing this because we're saying that you don't need to hire an expensive consultant uh, to do a strategic plan with your church. As the pastor, as the members of the board, you can do a tremendous job just by working it yourselves. And that's why South Atlantic Conference is putting on this program this evening, because we would like every conference, every church rather in this conference, and wherever you are from, that you're watching from tonight, your church, we're advocating that every local church should have a strategic plan. First place I'm going to look when I come to your church is, where is your vision statement? What, the, what is your vision? Uh, what are you hoping to be? What are you hoping to accomplish? What are you hoping to be known as in your community? You have to have some kind of a vision. If you don't have one for your church as a congregation, chances are the people in the community won't know what you stand for. Yeah, they'll know that you worship on Saturday. They might know you don't eat pork, but beyond that, what's next? What else do they know about you? They know you don't go to work, but what else? What, what, how, do, how do they factor into why you're in their neighborhood? Why do you have this building on their street? What's your vision? And then the vision tells what you hope to accomplish or hope to be or hope to be known for. The mission is the roadmap that tells you how you get there. All right? So there are two different types of statements. We won't take the time tonight to unpack those. You can do that locally. I'd like to encourage you to do research on Google to understand the, the significant differences between a vision statement and a mission statement. I will tell you this in passing, most mission statements that I've seen for churches are way too long. I have a rule of thumb. My rule of thumb, each church I've pastored, if the mission statement is longer than the, 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 the number of words in John 3, 16, which is 25 words, it's too long. All right, so that's kind of my standard. If it's longer than 25 words, it's too long. And we want to revise that thing. We want to synchronize that thing. We want to make sure it's relevant. And, so, you know, the mission statement is something that you've got to revise every several years. Take that thing out and look at it. Put it up on your walls. Make sure it's in the bulletin. It doesn't come up on the screen on Sabbath mornings. People need to know what your mission is. All right? Then, of course, um, demographic studies or analysis. We, the last census that was done in the United States was done in 2020. And uh, that happened right around about the pandemic. And they released some information uh, around about 2022. That's the freshest information that you can get right now on a community here in the United States. In Jamaica, in the Bahamas, the Turks and Caicos, if you're watching from there tonight, I'm not sure when your last census was. Nonetheless, whatever the last one was, I would arm myself with that information if I were you. You want to know who lives in your community. How many people are there? It's political season just about all these countries right now. People are talking about the population. It's a good time for the church to start listening, paying attention, not for the partisan political rhetoric, but paying attention to what the people are saying. What are the politicians saying? What are they promising? What are the people asking for? All of this is information that you can use in your strategic plan, believe it or not. Then what about the church members? Church members have points of views. And so this is the part we call the SWOT analysis. We usually like to encourage that the church members be the one to do the SWOT analysis. And I did indicate before,
Mm-hmm. Okay, someone has a child who is speaking in the background. I'm going to ask you, please mute your device. Please mute your device. We appreciate your support and your cooperation in that regard. We, we don't need to hear conversations at this time. Please help us out with that, would you? All right, so um, the SWOT analysis, which we're going to unpack in some detail in the next slide or two, um, will help us to really get a grasp of the kind of information that this kind of analysis and evaluation will unearth for us. Now, can we also ask people in the community some questions that will help us with a strategic plan? Absolutely. So you want to look at people like your city council members, especially the one who is in charge of the area where your church is located. If you're in the Caribbean, I think you call that the parish council. So you have the parish councillors or the members of parliament. Seek an interview with those people. Uh, pick their minds. What are they hearing from the people on the ground? Talk with your law enforcement community, your police precinct. Uh, talk to your sheriff if you're in the United States. What are some of the hotspots? What are some of the troubling things that they are finding in the community? What are some of the needs that they see? Education, the Board of Education folk, um, PTA meetings. You'd be amazed to know the ton of information, the data you can pick up just by attending these meetings. Go to your city council meetings in your communities. Then there are non-governmental organizations like nonprofits, the Chamber of Commerce, United Way. Here in Georgia, where we are, Georgia Power does a lot of work in the communities in terms of granting um, and gifting for different projects, social causes, and uh, churches that I've pastored have benefited both from United Way and from Georgia Power. These corporate giants, they want to give back to the community. Um, outside of the United States, you might come into people like USAID and, and other um, international um, NGOs, um, tap into them and find out what are some of the things that they know because they have the resources, they have the manpower, that's kind of their wheelhouse, that's the sphere in which they operate, and they know what's happening on the ground even in your own country, all right, because that's, that's specifically what they are set up to do. And then, of course, there's the media. Do not underestimate the power of the media, the newspaper, the television, even social media in your community. This is kind of how you put your finger on what's going on around you. You've got to be where the people are hanging out and they're hanging out in the media space, right? What's going on on the news? What's going on on the talk shows on the radio? Uh, what's going on in the newspaper, in those editorials there? What's going on on Facebook and TikTok and Instagram? as it pertains to your community, your city, your parish, if you're in Jamaica, all right? So don't isolate yourself just as a church board and try to find all the information from within. Yes, you are a part of the community or a piece of the fabric of the neighborhood, but don't limit yourself to just from the Adventist tunnel vision type of perspective. There's a whole lot more to know about the community that you're attempting to serve by looking beyond the walls of your church. And don't be afraid to engage the people who are listed here. And then, of course, in just about every neighborhood, there is going to be somebody, not an Adventist, not an Adventist, but somebody who is known as a strong community leader. All right? You want to get to know people like that. They know what's going on. They, they, they are the pulse of the community. They know what the police are dealing with. They know what the business people are trying to get done. They know what development is coming in the next six months or, or 12 months from now because they're in the know. And so you want to partner with people like these so that you can be on the, on, the, on the leading edge of whatever developments or movements are coming down the pike. Now, here in the United States, when city council meetings are going on and you have the county commissioners meetings because of the pandemic, practically every municipality now, you can go online and look at their meetings while they are in the meeting on their YouTube channel. All right, everybody's doing that now. And it's one of my hobbies to actually sit while I'm working at my desk and to listen to what's going on at my local uh, board of commissioners meetings. A lot of stuff. You want to especially know about what's going on in that planning and zoning commission meeting. 
And that's where they're applying for licenses to, to, to reclassify, rezone plots of land across the city and tell you what kind of business or subdivision um, the developer is hoping to put up over there. And, and if you're not tuned into this kind of stuff, and if you're a pastor here, appoint a couple of people at your church and your church board to be the eyes and ears in the city council meeting, in the board of commissioners meetings, and other types of meetings. Something is happening down at the police department. Have somebody to go down there if you can't make it. So here's how this works. Ellen White says that Christ's method alone gives true success in reaching the people. And she said that he had a multi-step process. The first step was he filled with men as one who desired their good. Everything I just put on the screen from number three down to, ver to number seven, that's a way of mingling with the people in so many different ways. And of course, this is not an exhaustive list that I've shared with you here tonight. Let's go, go over now to the SWOT analysis. Let, let's, let's talk about this. The SWOT analysis, what is SWOT? So I'm gonna use some terms and this is coming from Forbes.com. So these are business terms. These are terms they use in the corporate world, but the principles and the practice are, are universal. And they work so well for the church context as well. A SWOT analysis, clearly now you see by what you see on the right-hand side of your screen, that SWOT is an acronym, which means strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. We're going to unpack this. But a SWOT analysis is a framework used in a business strategic planning to evaluate its competitive positioning in the marketplace. So just swap out the word business for the word church. All right, so the church is in the business of winning souls. In order to win souls, we've got to win the hearts of the people before we win their loyalty to Christ. We've got to win their interests. We've got, Ellen Rice says again, he mean good with men as one who desired their good. She, she said that uh, he, he showed them his sympathy. He ministered their needs, and then he won their confidence. And only when those things were accomplished did Jesus say, follow me. Sometimes we go to perfect strangers. They don't know us like that, and we tell them, follow me. And when they don't follow us, then we, we call them names. We say they're unspiritual, they're secular-minded, they're this and they're that. But why don't they follow us? Because there's no relationship. Would you follow somebody, a perfect stranger? I doubt it very much. They are intelligent too. They would follow if there was some kind of a relationship. So first, we want to work on a relationship. So the SWOT analysis is a framework that gives us some 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 the, the competitive positioning in the marketplace. The analysis looks at four key characteristics that are typically used to compare how competitive the church can be within that particular community. And notice I'm taking out words here now, right? So our focus here is the local church, your congregation. How can you be competitive? Pastor, why should we be competitive? What are we competing against? I'm glad you asked. You're competing against every Sunday church in your neighborhood. Every church in your community is, I'm going to use the word, let's get real. Every church in your community is competing for the hearts and minds of the people who live there, your church included. Literally what you're doing, just like a business, you're seeking it as a larger uh, market share of the population to turn their hearts toward what you understand to be the truth of God's word in accepting Jesus Christ and the three angels' messages. That's your goal. That's your mission. That's your motive in everything that you do in your neighborhood. All right? So what you're looking, what you're trying to do, you're trying to turn the hearts of people who are unchurched to Jesus, and you're trying to reach the churched people and to say, hey, let me clarify some of what you already believe. I know you believe in Jesus, but let, let, let me give you some additional information about what he has said to see if you would consider making some adjustments in the way you worship him, all right? And that's what every Seventh-day Adventist church does. So a proper SWOT analysis can give you a fact-based, I like that phrase, fact-based analysis to make decisions from, or it could spark your creativity for new, not products, but ministries or directions to take your church in, all right? So with that said, let's look now at how the SWOT works. On the left-hand side of the screen, in the yellow column, we have 
strengths and weaknesses. That's the S and the W in the acronym SWAT. On the right-hand side, under the blue column, we have opportunities and threats. Now, the yellow side or the left-hand side deal with the internal factors that SWAT is concerned about. And on the right-hand column, we're looking at the external factors that SWAT is concerned about. And the, the internal are the things that you have control over. The external are things that are happening around you in the community that you have no primary control over. But you need to know what they are. So that's a simple breakdown of what a SWOT analysis is. So we would do a questionnaire. Now, I love SurveyMonkey, right? So you could either pass out sheets of paper, make up a survey on a paper. To me, that's harder to deal with. You know, we have more you know, um, you know, information technology now. Send out an electronic survey and people just respond. It comes right back to you on the computer. You can tabulate that thing, all right? I leave that to you to decide how you want to do that piece, all right? But the strengths. The question, the research question could simply be something like this in terms of the SWOT. From your perspective, and this is me phrasing it, from your perspective, what are some of the strengths um, or things that you and others like about our church? Simple question. You'd be amazed to know the amount of data you'll get back just from that one question. Or... Concerning the weaknesses, what are some of the things that we can do better as a congregation? That's, that's asking about the weaknesses, right? So a weakness is an adverse internal attribute about your church and the company. Again, this is from Forbes.com. It's a business portal. So I'm transposing words. What, a weakness is an adverse internal attribute about your church that negatively takes away from what you're doing well. Right? That's what the weakness is defined as. The strength are the internal positions about your church that you can control and that often provide you with a competitive advantage. And we're going to show you in the next several slides um, some examples of strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. An opportunity is an external factor. Remember, on the right side, we deal with the external factors. On the left-hand side, we deal with the internal factors. The internal things are the things that you can control. The external things are things in your environment, in the neighborhood. You have no primary control over them, but you need to know what they are so you can harness them for your advantage. All right? So an opportunity is an external factor that provides promise or is likely to contribute to your potential success. Get me paused to get a cough in here. I'm straining to cough at this point. Thanks for um, working with me with that. The threats. A threat is an external factor that you have no control over, which could negatively impact the success of your church. And I'm going to show you what some potential threats could be for your local congregation. These are typically acknowledged so that you can provide a plan to overcome each one of those threats. All right. So let's look at some examples now of strengths of a local church. These could be some examples, even in your congregation. Some could be, some may not be. So when we ask the question on the survey, what are some of the things that people like about our church? Or what are some of the strengths that you can identify that you would be happy to use as invitational points for people to come to your church? And... Well, let me send to you. Let me go, Patch. Excuse me. Excuse me. Please mute. Please, please keep your device muted. Thank you. All right. So um, you might get feedback that says we have an outstanding, highly rated music ministry. Maybe have a hot praise team. All right. That's that's a strength. People love music. People love good music in church. Beautiful. Maybe some people will respond. We have a transformational worship experience. When I come, I sense and experience the presence of God. There's awe in the worship. Maybe 
Somebody will rave and say, we have an excellent, effective, exciting children's church. They just love the fact that our church has invested money to make sure that our children's church is top notch. All of these are strengths. Why? Because their families looking for church homes and part of the decision making process that they go through is how will this church benefit my children? Do, does that church even have children? And if they do, do they spend adequately on making sure it is properly staffed? They have good materials, um, instructional materials. Is it attractive? Do the kids have fun? All right. So people are looking for churches. People are always looking for churches. And one of the biggest turnoffs that we know of is when they come and there is there is there is nothing much in store or in place for the children. All right. What about the location? Well, our church is located in one of the main highways in our city. Um, we have a we have a great view um, coming up and down the street. And, and we don't really have to advertise our location. Our location advertises the church. Awesome. All of these are strengths. People don't find it hard to know where your church is. Somebody might say, our, our attraction, our facility is clean and attractive. We have lots of um, space to host events. That, will, that could be a plus for so many different things. I will see a few examples of that in the, in the next following slides. We have a beautiful curb appeal. Our parking lot is only two years old, so it's not cracked. The grass not growing up in it. Ladies don't get their heels stuck in cracks in when they walk into their cars. And we don't have to slosh through the water and mud to get from the church to our, our vehicles, right? Beautiful curb, the plants, the flowers, the flower beds, landscaping guys do an awesome job. All of these, believe it or not, are strengths when it comes to local church. Um, we have a well-known pantry. A lot of people come to our pantry for food each month. That's a strength. That's a plus. All right. Our website is popping. Our, our media ministry is popping. We, we have thousands of people watching us every week on our YouTube channel. Our TikTok, our Instagram, our Facebook. Our, they are, they are lots of followers. That's a great report. So those are strengths. So people know who you are. They're following you because you're putting out a great worship experience. We have a notoriety as a warm and loving church. These are some of the feedback that you might get on the strengths um, as examples when you put that survey out there. All right. So let's go to examples of weaknesses of the local church. Examples of weaknesses. And by the way, as we're going through this exercise, some things are formulating in your minds. All right. And they're becoming apparent to you as we go through this as to, oh, so we have to take a real hard look at our congregation when we're doing strategic planning. Yes, you do. Everything that you do is, is now under the microscope because a strategic plan has to address everything, all right? Everything. Let's look at some examples of local church weaknesses. Maybe when you put the survey out, what are some of the weaknesses? What are some of the areas that we desperately need to improve in? Maybe we could ask the question that way. Can I, it's an open-ended question, right? So that people can just freely put down whatever is on their heart. And there's no wrong answer. You're asking for information. You're going to get a lot of data coming back at you. Open-ended questions. That's the way you go. So some people might say in your church, music is uninspiring and antiquated. You know, some people might complain, we only sing hymns at this church. That's why I know young people are here. Unimpressive worship experience. How can the worship experience be unimpressive? We don't start on time. Uh, we, we don't let the praise team sing or lead out in the, in, in the songs and the transition music and the responses. Whoever is at the microphone just, 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 just starts singing and that's not their gift. Not too many people are not going to come for too long if that's what we do. Insufficient children's ministry or no children. Or we have children and we just take a nonchalant approach to how we do children's church. We just tell a little half dead story and we send them to call it the offering, send them back to their seat. And that's the extent of it. Right. So people might see that as a weakness. We could do better in that area. Somebody might highlight that our church is not on the beaten path. We're kind of way in the back of the, the hood, 
because somebody's great grandmother 55 years ago donated a piece of land. And instead of saying thanks, but no thanks, we grabbed it and built a church back there that nobody knows is back there. Or it could be such a rough neighborhood that nobody wants to come in that side of town because they're breaking into the cars in the church parking lot right there on Sabbath, right? So these could be weaknesses. Then it could be an unattractive church facility. Maybe that thing needs to be pressure washed. Maybe all that grime and, 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 and the stuff from 30 years have not been washed off the brickwork because we've gotten accustomed to it and we think everybody is supposed to be okay with it. But it's unattractive. The church sign is, is broken. There's no time when the, when the worship service starts. The pastor's name is not on the sign. The sign needs a new paint job. In fact, you need a new sign. It's unattractive. So the SWOT analysis, that stuff is going to come up to the front. Little or no community engagement. Nobody knows who we are. If the church shuts down tonight, the neighborhood won't miss us. And sadly, that's the story for many of our congregations. Missing or poorly maintained websites. Some of our churches don't have a website. Um, in some countries, that could be an expensive thing. Uh, here in the North American Division, every local church automatically has a website. If it's in eAdventist, once you're registered with the conference, the North American Division through Adventist Church Connect automatically makes a website for the name of your church. All one has to do is go in and maintain that thing. Buy a domain name connected to it, and you're live. And I've seen many churches that don't even have a website. Some churches are not on social media. Right? So people don't know that you are there. And so these could be construed as weaknesses. And then, on top of that, the few people who know that the church is in the back of that neighborhood know that it's a church. That those people are always fighting with each other. So that's, that's a weakness that's going to go against that church. All right. So these could be some of the weaknesses. Again, you're looking at facts. You're looking at realities. You know, what are some of the ways in which our church could be perceived um, to be weak? What are some of the things that we can, do, we can do much better in as a church? And these are some of the things that you could find from your, re from your research. Let's look at some opportunities. Again, these are the external things now. External. One of the things that you might discover when you're doing the SWOT analysis is that the city planners know that a population boom is headed your way. In one church where I pastored, I was able to tell the members, and I didn't live in that city. I live, I live in, the, in the other city, of the larger church. But I was able to tell them in the smaller city, actually it was the largest city, but smaller church. I lived where the larger church was, but in a smaller city. That's kind of ironic, right? The larger city had the smaller church. And I was able to tell them two years before it happened that a population boom was coming because I was following the county commissioners meetings. And they were telling us that in the next 10 years, 30,000 new people were moving into that county. 30,000 in 10 years. D.R. Horton, the largest home builder in the United States, bought 200 acres of woodland across the street from that church, literally across the street, was a woodland, a forest. And they came and bought the 200 acres. They pushed on every single tree to build 547 homes. I started telling the members that two years before it happened because I saw when they applied for the conditional use permit and to do this stuff and to change the zoning on some of the tracks of the land and to get the approvals going forward from two years out to build these homes. I was sitting at my desk at my house watching them in the county and the, and the, and the um, zoning and planning um, commission meeting approving those permits. I was able to go to church and said, in your neighborhood, D.R. Hartney is coming to build 540. So we created a part in our strategic plan, Operation 547. How are we going to meet the needs of these 547 new homeowners and their families when they start building those homes? And they're, they're still building those homes today. All right? So population boom. What could this guy, population boom that's coming, what kind of opportunity does this represent to your local church? And you want to also include in that the immigrant groups that are moving in. Right? Uh, if it's an immigrant group of, of, of Hispanic Latino people, 
what kind of opportunities does this present to your church? Maybe you could plan and start preparing to offer English as a second language, right? Stuff like that. Uh, you can start planning to have daycare. You can start planning um, how to do VBS in Spanish. So there's different things. You know what's going on. Government or other grants might be available for community improvement projects. Um, the way you know about those things is by engaging with the leaders of the community. You go to the meetings, you follow the news, you talk to people in the know, and they'll tell you what's going on. Then what does this mean for your church? Can your church get a piece of the pie to serve the community with? I'm telling you, church is our passion. That's what we've done. We have had money coming through because we created the community resource centers in the, in the churches. And so they were the outreach arm. I don't know. I have to know. Oh, uh, Vincent, the please, same. please, please mute that microphone. Please mute that microphone. All right. So, um, and sometimes the government leaders themselves are asking the nonprofit sector for help to carry out social programs. Why do they do this, by the way? Here in the United States, here's what we do. The government knows that churches are willing to help. Churches have the largest group of volunteers than any other organizations. And so rather than going out and hiring people to do certain things, the government will put the word out, we need some volunteers from the nonprofit sector. They know we're gonna run coming and they'll provide the money to do the work that we put back in the community. And so your local church can benefit by being a partner in these kinds of social programs, law enforcement initiatives, where I live in Douglas County here in Georgia, um, our sheriff's office and our police department, very active in the community. Our police chief, um, Chief Gary Sparks, a uh, friend of mine, um, his whole theme for the police department is one with our community. And, and he's serious about that. And so we have a strong partnership with him, right? So he focuses on youth empowerment and doing uh, conflict resolution programs, um, nonviolent um, programs, conflict de-escalation programs with them every Saturday at the police department. And of course, the sheriff's office deal with the ex-offenders, people coming out of jail. And the church I used to pastor here in the city where I live, um, we got involved and became a station of hope for people who are returning residents or ex-offenders, helping them to reintegrate back into community without going back to jail. So there are so many things that we can, we can tap into. Then in some of our neighborhoods, more so here in the States than in the islands, um, we have food deserts is what we call them. All parts of cities where there's not one food store. You'll have the liquor store. You'll have the, the tobacco store. You will have the, 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 the check cashing store, but you will not have a grocery store. So provide alcohol and tobacco and a place to cash your check and take 30% off your check for cashing your check, but you can't buy food. You have no right, you have no car. And so you end up going to the local gas station and the convenience store to buy expensive stuff, which are usually processed foods and not a full, complete, wholesome meal. And we call those food deserts, whole sides of entire cities. Nobody wants to invest over there, okay? What can the church do? These are opportunities. How can the church make a difference in the lives of those people across the track on that side of the track. Homelessness, just today in the news here in Douglas County where I live, okay, you know, we're under a big freeze right now. All right, it's going down to must be 13 degrees tonight where I live. And so there are people living outside. The police department has opened up the community building as a shelter. The Methodist church in town, the large Methodist church and several others are opening up their facilities as shelters. What can your church do? Right? How can you help with food? So somebody providing a shelter, can you bring some food over there? Some warm meals. So we're talking about opportunities to serve. So there's local churches are asking, what can we do? That's because we haven't examined, we haven't done a SWAT. We, we don't know what's going on around us sometimes because we, we're, we're so focused on 
what goes on within the four walls. But we're saying in this training this evening that the four walls, that's just where we come to plan what we do beyond the four walls. It's not wrong with being in the four walls. We need somewhere to sit as we plan. But when we get there, that's not the end of what we do. That's just the beginning. That's, that, that's, that's the groundwork place that we come to. The city and nonprofits sometimes need meeting space for community events. New Jerusalem that they used to pastor, we took the light in letting the city come in, county come in, use our church facility, both the sanctuary, the fellowship hall, or the classrooms in the education building. We don't charge them a dime. Why would we charge them? Because we're here, church is a part of the fabric of the community, right? Nonprofit partnerships, because we got involved, other people wanted to be involved. They wanted to sit on their boards and their committees. They wanted to partner with us on different projects. And we were like, yes, let's go for it. As long as it's appropriate and advisable, let's do it. All right. I want to tell you that we're not asking you to do anything that's going to compromise our message or your conscience. But there are a lot of stuff that we can do that's not going to compromise anything. We're just there to help people. And this is the big piece right here. Uh, niche areas. So we discovered in our community here in Douglasville, where I live, back in 2015, and back to the church in 2014, 2015, we launched a new initiative called uh, Law Enforcement and First Responders Appreciation Day. We did it every January, second Sabbath in January. That thing became a, 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 an annual event. Police officers, Sheriffs, deputies, uh, fire department folk, uh, emergency management system people, they came, we had a service for them, we fed them. They love having this food, by the way. And so uh, that thing became an annual event. COVID kind of kicked it a minute to the side. They're starting it back up this year, the new pastor. Two years after we started that initiative, we came up with another initiative. We launched an initiative called the Consecration Service for elected and appointed officials of Douglasville and Douglas County. I mean, we knew everybody. They knew us. So we like, you know what? We want our church to serve these people. We elected them as our public servants, but we, let's serve them. Let's minister to them. And so we did that program on a Tuesday evening after work for them. I remember the first year we did that and it was supposed to be an hour and a half event. We started at 5.30, supposed to end at seven, nine o'clock, they were still sitting there in the fellowship hall. The deacon started cutting the lights out because the, 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 the superior court judges, the, the district attorney, uh, the sheriff's deputies, all these people, um, solicitor general, all these people are there, uh, county commissioners, uh, city council persons, and they're hobnobbing with their colleagues. No church had ever done that for them before. No entity. We fed them. My hospitality team made nine different types of soups. It was January. Nine different types of soup. Whole January night. And those people sat. They fellowship. They ate. They laughed. We mingled with them. We laid hands on them and prayed over them. And I'm here to tell you, they never forgot that thing. We did that until COVID came. It's, they're having it again next week. They're starting it back up now at the church. I'm no longer the pastor there. And I thank God for the pastor who is there continuing the legacy. So, the, and that became our thing. That became New Jerusalem's thing, right? So we became known for that. It was a niche area that God identified that we could take care of. Examples of threats to local church mission. Threats. Now, this one is important. Let me cough again. Now, we talked about in the, uh, the opportunity side about the population boom. Once, and that could be a blessing to a church. That could be a blessing. What could not be a blessing if there's a decline in the population? And that has been known to happen in some places in the United States. Certain major industries, for example, might have closed down, been phased out, people move away as a result. Uh, we talk, for example, about the Rust Belt in the United States. Uh, major industries that used to be um, in those areas, and they have been phased out through automation and uh, people moving the companies overseas and stuff like that. And so when the jobs leave, the people leave. 
And so a church that's in that situation can find itself teetering on the edge of non-existence. And so that could be a problem. Then, of course, there could be a problem of high and increasing unemployment, as was mentioned before. There could be antagonism toward our message by our Sunday pastors in the area. There have been known to be a few of those in whatever country you are. So this could be stretched to the local mission. Um, your church could be located in a crime-infested area. Um, you know, could be a really bad situation. And nobody wants to come there to attend a church. And there might be times when your SWOT analysis might reveal that you, maybe it's time to move, to relocate. Maybe you need to change your address. Okay? Sometimes the church has to do that. Uh, there might be local ordinances that hinder or prohibit church activities in a normal way. Thankfully, we don't see that very often. And of course, there sometimes is a demographic shift in the area where the church is located. For example, you could have what we call in the States right now, um, gentrification taking place. So in some neighborhoods, um, New York, right here in Atlanta, is happening in a big way. A Memorial Drive, for example. Um, those run-down, traditionally African-American enclaves of neighborhoods, um, what developers are doing is snatching up those, those buildings. Some of them are old and they're tearing them down and building new buildings. And, and of course, the rent is going to be higher than the, than the traditional population in that area is able to pay. And so they get driven out um, from where they grew up because they can't afford that rent. That's called gentrification, all right? So you have a whole difference. So you have more Caucasian and Asian people moving in there. So the, the demographic has shifted. And if you have a church on that block and these were your, your, your members, African-Americans, and they were more on the lower end of the economic totem pole, and all of a sudden the whole area is getting white or Asian, um, of some kind, and those people are not coming to your black church, you could see that you might have a problem, all right? So these are just some of the, the, the things that could happen but with threats to the local church. Of course, there's so many others that we could put on the screen. So the SWOT analysis will help you to, to see this kind of information. That's the reason why I'm taking the time to unpack what the SWOT really is and what it does. So the SWOT analysis is a critical component of the strategic planning process. It's a reality check against what I call assumption ministry. An assumption ministry, I should have put in quotation marks to highlight that, right? But a lot of what we do is what I call assumption ministry. We are assuming facts, not in evidence. We are assuming that what we're doing we, we, is what the need is. And we have not done any kind of analysis um, to really figure out, are we hitting the spot? Let me define for you ministry. Ministry, my perspective, is defined as the process of discovering or identifying and meeting needs. The process of identifying and meeting needs. If you're not meeting an actual need, you really can't call that activity a ministry. You're just doing a program. But now, a program is not necessarily a ministry. A ministry you have to be meeting somebody's actual needs, all right? So I want you to keep that in mind. That's why we have to do strategic planning because it helps us to do a reality check. It helps us to really examine everything that we are doing. It helps us to see what we're not yet doing. It helps us, helping us to see what kind of changes we need, to, we need to make. And it helps us to see what we need to affirm in what we're doing, all right? The SWOT analysis will reveal a picture of what we're working with and provide data to aid in determining our strategic objectives. So it's 2024, what shall we do this year? What shall we do in 2025? Need a plan. Internal and external factors exert various influences on the local church's ability to carry out its gospel mandate for their community, right? We need to know what the internal factors are, internal factors are that are strengths and weaknesses, and we need to know what our external factors are that are that have the potential to, to affect us, both our opportunities and our threats. All right. Now, when we have done the analysis, we have done the SWOT, we have, we have gotten the feedback from the people, we, have, we, have, we now have a bunch of data in front of us. 
how do we unpack this data? How do we group this information and, and make it into workable um, um, material that we can that we can that we can do something with? The SWOT analysis produces lots of data, right? Bits and pieces of data. Uh, people are going to answer some in complete sentences, some with just a word, some with a phrase. Going to be a lot of stuff. A select committee or the church board itself should need to sort the data that's produced by the SWOT analysis. Okay? You got to go through everything. I'm in charge of strategic planning in the South Atlantic Conference. And I have what I call the strategic planning task force that I pulled together. I pulled the task force together last year in February when I was asked to carry this particular um, task. And I knew that the material, the data we're going to encounter, there was no way I could sit down by myself and saw through all that kind of verbiage. Not possible. And so I, I set about picking a task force that was representative of the demographic diversity of our conference, age groups, different nationalities, um, language groups, uh, et cetera, and positions, including workers and lay members and, and, and from the different sectors. And so you were, you, you were able to see the beauty of how it came together. And we produced the strategic plan for the conference. We call it, we, the acronym is MAPS, all right? And, uh, and so we had to sort through this stuff. The data now should be grouped according to what we call themes and trends. What are themes? So you see something like, um, and I'll show you a few examples on the next slide. Um, like we're talking about the facility. Let's say uh, people are mentioning the facility. We we'll call it the theme. What's a trend? A trend would be if you notice a number of people are talking about the same thing. For example, children's ministry, like 40, 50 people. So, so I call that a trend. So that, that topic is trending, in other words, right? So that's a clue to the, to the committee. We want to focus in on that. That's got to be addressed in the strategic plan. Right? You keep seeing stuff about the building. You keep seeing stuff about um, the media ministry. You, these are themes. themes. So you put those down as categories that you're going to fill in what the people are saying about those things. And then what the people are saying about those things, and you look for the trends in them. Uh, is it trending in a positive direction? Is it trending where we, it's a, a, all kind of a moment? We need, to, we need to really address that stuff. Right? So a picture begins to emerge regarding what strategic priorities should be addressed in the strategic plan itself. And my style is, and you don't have to do it the exact the same way I do it, but the way I like to do it is to summarize each area or category of data with a sentence, no more than three sentences. Just to kind of, because after, after you've looked at the data, you don't want to keep going back to the, to the, to the raw data um, over and over. Um, you just want to kind of summarize that thing so that, okay, for this category of data right here, this is our summary. I can leave this data alone. I may go look at it next year again, see what else we can learn from it, but I don't want to bother with it anymore. We've spent 18 hours on that already. What's the summary? What's the lesson from that bunch of data right there? All right? That's what I'm talking about. So that we can have information, because data becomes information. No, now you're no. turning it now so that you can know how no. to use it. Right. Um, please, so number two is our planet marketing director director program. Now, at this level, it means that you have helped at least a hundred. Could you mute that person for me, please? No, it's not by. Please mute. Please mute. Yes. All right. So here's an example of data grouping. I mentioned about terms like the facility or the worship service, curb appeal. So if you see those, those, those themes coming up, just list them, list them. And, um, and then any trends that you see, make a note of that as well. Group the express concerns or affirmations under their relevant case. So I would put on a sheet. Of, in fact, what I do is I have a sheet of paper just for youth. If youth ministry is something that they are talking about, I have a sheet of paper called youth ministry. And everything they say about youth ministry, we enter under that. 
or if it's on the computer that we're putting it, um, then we type in onto the page for youth ministry, itemize or bullet points what they're saying about youth ministry or about curb appeal or about children's ministry or about the worship music. All right. So we have a separate sheet of paper or in the computer so that we are we are um, we are separating them out from each other. Right. Then there's a summary statement that I like to give, as I mentioned before. So let's use children's ministry as an example. I would say something like the data shows that there is a wide cross section of members who feel that we could do better in the area of children's ministry. This matter was mentioned by at least 45 respondents to the survey monkey. And I say it's just like that. We have looked at all the different um, things that people said, but that's a lot of that's a lot of data. I'm not trying to retain that in my memory. So I put a summary statement together, kind of summarize what the gist of the people's concerns were. And that's sufficient for the committee to work with. And as we start working on the strategic priorities, then we come upon the statement and we start putting some things in place to address the specific concerns that were raised back then. All right, so this is an example of what I mean by data grouping, and summary statement. Again, you're going to receive a copy of this in a PDF format in the chat before we're done here tonight. So remember I mentioned about using a separate column or paper? Look at the left side, children's ministry. <laughs> Excuse me. So some of the things that could have been said, we need more children in the church. We need to improve our children's ministry classrooms. We don't have enough contemporary children's ministry resources, or we need more qualified people working in children's ministry. Those could have been things that were said in the SWOT. All right. And of course, those would come under the weaknesses side of the SWOT analysis, under the W, right? On the right side of the screen, we notice that they were talking about ch the church facility and the grounds. And the people are saying things like the restrooms don't feel inviting. The restrooms are dated. One men's room commode has been stopped up every week. The driveway, now they, now they switch to the outside, needs to be pressure washed. You know, you drive up to some churches and the driveway is as grungy and black as could be. It has never been pressure washed or not been pressured in the last 10 years. And, it's, and, it's, and the members keep coming every Sabbath and for them it's normal. But for the person who's seen it for the first time, their eyes are in shock. And sometimes we, we, we miss that as the members. We, we fail to recognize um, that it really looks bad, right? The flowers and shrubs along the sides and the front of the church need to be updated. Sometimes we let those plants stay out there too long. So we have to know that sometimes we have to chop those plants down, uproot them and plant fresh plants. You know, they were never designed to be beautiful forever. It's okay to chop them down and plant new stuff. Believe me, it is. <laughs> right. Developing now the strategic objectives. All right, let's look, how we, look at how we do that. What themes do you see emerging? Now, we talked about the themes earlier. So we saw children's ministry. We saw media ministry. We saw facility. These are the themes, right? And what trends are evident in the data? Seems to be a lot of people saying we need to do a whole lot of work regarding children's ministry. Hmm? Now, use this information to list potential objectives. Just, just start listing stuff. What are the objectives? How do, how do we correct the stuff that we're seeing? How do we improve what's coming out of the data at us. The committee will then meet to prioritize the list for mission of relevance. Relevance, critical word, and resource availability. So everything, every need that's identified, depending on the size of your church and the financial ability of your church, you may or may not be able to address everything this year. So what you want to do, you want to then look at now what would be the priorities for 2024? And what would be your priorities for 2025? 
And even what would be your priorities for 2026? So you want to have a, a strated strategic plan. Strategic planning usually covers more than one year, right? My own preference is from three to five years, somewhere between there. I have done strategic planning that covered only two years initially, but before the second year was done, we already had agreed that we would have a five-year plan that we would roll out within the la um, the beginning of the, the last six months of the, of the current plan. But when I just got to this particular church, it was just some dire needs. We, we had to jump in right away and just start taking care of some stuff. But we needed a structured approach, a playbook. That's what the strategic plan is, a playbook for what you're trying to get done. And we had to move right away. But we knew that we couldn't do but a two-year plan initially. And so we did from 2014 to 2016. So we call it up um, Vision 2016. And then in 2016, we rolled out Vision 2020. And you're going to see some of Vision 2020 on the back end of this presentation. Three sites from that church I used to pastor um, and Vision 2020, some stuff we were able to get done. Right, I pulled out three of those slides and dropped in here just as examples as to how to write the plan. All right, so let's talk about that. Writing a smart strategic plan. SMART, as I told you before, um, was an acronym. And here's what SMART means. Every successful business has clearly set and articulated goals to attain specific objectives. SMART goals is an acronym for specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, time-based objectives, right? So the, in the blocks at the top, the colored blocks, specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, time-based. And you see the explanation below those themes as to what's involved in each of those. So there are five, uh, there are five questions that we want to answer in terms of making sure that what we're doing is specific. Who's involved? Because somebody has to be, somebody has to be placed over that thing in order for that thing to get done. It's not going to get done by itself. All right. I'm going to explain that a bit. What do I want to accomplish? What specific thing are we trying to accomplish? All right. When do I want to achieve this? So we're talking about benchmarks here as well. When? Timeline, right? Where does my goal take place? Where does this happen? And why is this goal important? We want to be specific. We want to provide information in a, in a synthesized manner. The information needs to, be, it needs to be inherent in the specific thing that we're trying to get done, but without using a lot of words. And I'll show you examples of that. Measurable. What metrics are you going to use to determine if you meet the goal? How will you know, in other words, when you have when you have accomplished your objective? And what is your objective? Is your objective to completely implement something? Or if you're trying to, if you're trying to reclaim members who are disengaged from your church, maybe you set a certain amount that for 2024, that the goal would be we we lovingly encourage 15 people to reconnect with the church family, right? So we put a specific number. So that's measurable. So by the time, and, and, and by what time? Is it by December 31 or is it by, is it by um, September 30? So put, put, put some kind of benchmark in there along with the number. So both of those things make up the benchmark the number and the timeline that we're working with. And so when October 30 or September 30 comes, then we can look how many people were we successfully able to help reconnect to the church family. Did we, did we hit the 50? Right? So that's measurable. Is it a project that's going to take a few months to complete? then plan and set some milestones by considering specific tasks to accomplish. What about achievable? 
Is it a realistic goal? The goal is meant to inspire motivation. Think about how to accomplish the goal and if you have the tools or the skills or the resources that you need to achieve that goal. So there are some things that you might set out to do and you may not have internally the skill set or the resources. So here's an excellent idea. Is there somebody in the community, a non-Adventist, depending on what the thing is, who has that skill set, who could be a resource person to either do or teach somebody how to do what you're trying to accomplish? Or is there another nonprofit in the community that you could partner with to accomplish that particular thing? It's your goal, but you don't have the skill set, the resources to accomplish it with. Does it mean that it's a goner? Does it mean it cannot be done? Not necessarily. You can partner with somebody else. All right? If you don't currently possess them, consider what it would take to attain them. That's what I just shared with you. Is the goal relevant? A goal needs to align with your church's overall objectives. All right? So don't include anything in your strategic plan that's not going to contribute to the overall goals that you're trying to accomplish for that year. So much so that when we sit down as the church board to do the calendar of events each year, one of the things that I have spread before us on the table in the board meeting is the strategic plan. Because when you tell me as the women's ministry leader or as the youth ministry leader or as the personal ministry leader that here are your goals for this year that you'd like to have on the calendar, you're going to have to explain to me on the board how do those things through strategic alignment now, help us to accomplish what the strategic plan said that the church voted. Okay, see, you've got to, whatever you do as an officer, it has to, it has to, in some tangible way, help us to accomplish the strategic plan. If it's going to take away time and resources and energy and the unity of the church from the strategic, we're not doing it. That's how I lead. So everything that we're going to do once we vote the strategic plan, the strategic plan becomes the Bible. After the Bible, of course. All right? We follow that thing. And we're going to see why in just a minute. All right? Then it's time-based. Anyone can set goals. But if it lacks realistic timing, chances are you're not going to succeed. So do you have enough time to accomplish that thing? Or are you allowing too much time to accomplish that thing? Because... You can, you can lose on either end of the spectrum. So ask specific questions about the goal, deadline, and what can be reached and what can be accomplished within that time period. And make sure that it's a reasonable time. That doesn't put too much pressure on the people who are going to have to carry it out. All right? So these are this is how you divide, design SMART goals. SMART is an acronym that means goals must be specific, must be measurable, must be achievable, must be relevant, must be time-based, all right? So here's an example of how we write a goal. Of course, the strategic plan is a list of a number of goals and telling us how we're going to accomplish them. So, so let's say the goal in this particular piece of the strategic plan is to improve our outreach effectiveness and nurture to our own children and our neighborhood children. And so we've been talking about children's ministry, to understand that. So how we could write the strategic objective in this way. This is an example, right? So we say something like, refurbish the children's ministry classroom. And what that means, we're gonna put some specifics now in parentheses, change the carpet, new paint scheme, replace all the furniture, New window treatments, update the lighting. Where do you think we got that information from? The data from the, the SWOT analysis. This is what the people were saying. All right? And install new audiovisual equipment and a big screen TV and purchase updated instructional resources and new toys. And then what we want to go is the whole next, next way further. Rebrand children's ministry as the Kids for Christ Creative Center with their own YouTube streaming channel. 
by the end of March 2024. And to cap it off, we're going to recruit and train additional staff. That's very specific. It's measurable. These are itemized. You can see if these things are done or not. All right? It's achievable. And, and, let's, and let's, let's break that down. Let's show a chart because I did one. So does your objective meet the SMART test? It's specific. Yes, you can see the list of tasks to be done. It's specific stuff. It's measurable because we can ensure 100% completion of the listed tasks by the end of March 2024. Right? Why? Because, because we have the funds. The funds are available to complete this objective in the allotted time. So it's, it makes it achievable. Is it relevant? Yes, because it will help us to realize our overall goal of effective ministry to more children. So it's relevant. Is it time-based? Is it timely? Yes, we set a time of the end of March of 2024. And that's how you'd write a strategic um, goal. All right? And so the strategic plan is simply a series of strategic I appreciate those of you who are praying for me because throughout the damn coughing more, just trying to talk. So I praise God for the limited interruptions we're having here tonight. All right, let's look at this. Another way of looking at it, writing organizational goals or ministry goals. So we ask the question, what shall we do? That's called the goal. How shall we do it? That's our game plan, our action steps, the playbook. That's the strategic plan itself. Who shall be responsible for doing it? This is an important question. So everything that we put in the strategic plan needs to have someone listed either by name or by title or office that they hold assigned to carrying that particular function out. Because if somebody isn't assigned to do it, when the completion date arrives, everybody will discover that nobody did it because it was assumed that anybody would do it, All right? And we can't afford to do that. When shall it be, shall it, shall it be done? So that's the time base. We need to put a start time and a completion date there. Start date and completion date, right? For every task that's in the strategic plan. So that if you don't put the start date, then it probably won't get started. And if you don't put a completion date, it probably will not get finished, even if it is started. Because there's no concrete benchmark that we're working by. And so we got to make sure that we, we, it, it, we got to make sure that it's, 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 we have to button it down tight. And then what is the current status? So from time to time, we have to get a progress report. We have to do an evaluation to see how are we doing with the implementation of the strategic plan. So I'm gonna show you now three slides that I pulled out of a strategic plan that we did for Vision 2020 in a church I used to pastor when I was in, the, in, in Irish ministry. So one of the areas that we focused on, one of the, this was a theme that emerged, of course, in the, in the SWOT analysis, and it was evangelism and church growth. This was a theme, right? So we called it a category. And in this, we determined that we wanted to, we wanted to develop 12 soul winners in the church. And the strategy was we'll train and develop what we called the Engage Connect ministry team. Engage Connect was kind of like a fusion of the interest coordinator ministry and the ushers ministry. Interest coordinator and ushers. We can fuse them and call them Engage Connect. And we felt that we needed to make this shift in how we practiced ministry from the parking lot to the pulpit, to, to, the, to the pew. The contacts that we had with people needed, we needed, we needed a different way of making people feel that they belong at the church. And so we put a system in place that by the time I got up to do the welcome, I had a tablet in front of me. 
And the people who had been in church, by the time I got up there, their names would be on the tablet because I would send them to me electronically from the door. And so we never asked people to get up and introduce themselves. And we never called them visitors. We referred to them as our guests. And so we introduced and welcomed our guests instead of inviting our guests to stand up and tell us who they are, recognizing that a lot of people are shy. And they, a lot of people, the research actually shows that a lot of people don't visit churches because they don't want people to make them stand up and say something. It's actually a turnoff for a lot of people, right? So we, we did research on that. And we started to see a lot of return guests. People would come back multiple times, okay? And found the church to be, to be very friendly. And so we started that. Um, we, we started that. Uh, January 4 that year and the goal was to complete the training by January 25 and that was assigned to the pastoral staff the pastoral staff is the pastor and the elders that's kind of how I do my, 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 my ministry practice then we had a goal for that year of 150 people uh, in attendance 150 people in attendance we had about 120 125 we started the year and we wanted to wanted to see an increase. And so the strategy was um, have reclaiming ministry and evangelism. So Engage Connect was a part of that, as you see over here in terms of the assigned tool. And part of that was what we call code, community outreach and, um, and, and um, discipleship ministry. That's what we call personal ministries, community outreach and discipleship ministries. And so from January to June, that was our goal, was reclaiming people, was doing personal evangelism, striving to reach that goal of 150 people in attendance by June 27th. The point of this is you're seeing that the goals were specific, they were measurable, they were attainable, they were relevant, and they were time-based. That's the point of this exercise, all right? So I'm not gonna go through everything on the slide. We also looked at communication ministry, same thing. We found that we were doing poorly in the communication department. We had to completely revamp that thing. Um, we were doing a lot of great things at the church. Nobody outside the church was knowing about it. So we needed to, um, to up our game in terms of doing a better job at telling our own story. And so we, we recognized that we had to retrain our communication team. We had to add some new people to the team. We actually provided new leadership for that team. And we got our stories out in the union newspaper, uh, in the Southern Union, it's called the Southern Tidings. Um, we created a Facebook page for the church. We did a better job, um, at least initially, of maintaining the, the church website. And everything that we were doing, uh, and I'm known as a paparazzi everywhere I go, I take a lot of pictures um, just as, as a hobby. But um, we started posting pictures online. And for the next worship service, people saw themselves on the screen as part of the story. So uh, the background to some of the music, it'd be a snapshot of a part of the congregation. People saw themselves on the screen next week. All right, kind of made it nice. Went into the media room, took pictures of them back there working. Went over to the musicians area in the church, took pictures of them playing. They show up on the screen next week. So we just found different ways of making things nice. All right, but everything here is, you see the specific things that we sought to do. We listed them as, as goals, the strategy we're going to use to accomplish them. The start date, the completion date, and who was assigned to do those things. And then, of course, we had media ministry. So communication, media. So we, we, we had a great need for both. And we decided to start streaming our services. And we had, we had just taken that vote when COVID started. COVID, again, this is Vision 2020. And COVID came... And we started streaming in 2021 when we went back to church in the month of month of July in that congregation. And I served there for another six months 
before I was rotated out. But if you look at the stuff that we put, you could see, you, you could tell exactly what we were trying to do, what we intended to do. And, and uh, okay, Sister Barbara, I see you. And, um, and so I was, uh, we were able to, to make some headway where this was concerned. All right. Now let's talk about, and we're coming to an end here now, implementing and evaluating the strategic plan. This is critical. I've said a lot here tonight, but what I'm about to tell you, some of the most important things that I could say in this presentation, here we go. You've got to implement the plan. Many churches have actually taken the steps to create strategic plans that never got implemented. Some started, many didn't implement it in full. A specific person or group of people must be identified and assigned in the written strategic plan itself, like you saw me do on the previous slides, to carry out or oversee the completion of every single strategic objective, every single one. The strategic plan cannot and will not implement itself, beloved. So that's why we need orientation and training for a successful implementation and completion of the strategic planning process. And then there must be strategic alignment. These are the two most important things I'm telling you tonight. You have to have some specifically assigned people to carry out every single phase of the plan. If you don't, it's gonna fail. And every officer of the church must act in unison, in total strategic alignment in terms of what they're doing for ministry with the one united purpose of fulfilling the church's strategic plan. You cannot vote a strategic plan as a church and then the officers take off running in different directions doing whatever else they feel like doing. That's a recipe for guaranteed failure. All right? And we're having this program this evening because we're saying that your local church does not have to fail. So having gone through this presentation this evening, what you're seeing is that it is possible to be very busy as a local church and not actually be accomplishing anything much. At the end of the year, you look around and say, okay, now what did we accomplish? You could be busy doing a lot of stuff, but it wasn't a vision. It wasn't a plan. And so we're encouraging you, pastors, church boards, as you get going with 2024, present and vote the strategic plan during a church business meeting. Plan an official launch of the strategic plan during the Sabbath morning service. And get different people to be involved in that program, right? Get people who normally are not upfront to be a part of this strategic planning initiative in your local church. Introduce your team that help to develop your plan. Give them their big ups, right? And every six months, conduct your reviews, your evaluation to see how you're meeting your benchmarks. Make adjustments where you need to, right? Usually it's your measurements or your time and sometimes personnel that you may need to make some adjustments in. But make those decisions as they come due. And may God bless you for your efforts to advance his cause in your part of God's vineyard. At this time, I'm gonna stop the share and I'm gonna open for question and answer at this time. All right, so we are open for Q and A. And while we're getting ready for the Q and A, I am going to post as promised in the chat, the, uh, the PDF version of the document that I just shared with you. All right. Can you send it to email addresses? 
Ah, that would be a little bit difficult for me to do. Um, unless, unless what I will do is this. I will put my email in the chat and you could send me your email address. That way I could focus on answering questions. All right, so that PDF is in the chat. I'm gonna put my email address in there now. All right. Okay, who has the first question or comment for this evening? And uh, did you guys benefit from the material this evening? All right, someone is reporting that they're not seeing the PDF. No, it's not there. Okay, I'm looking at it. It's loaded. Uh, just scroll back up. And, uh, and what I'll also do, I'll have our communication team to put this on the conference website for me tomorrow. So uh, if you don't see it in the chat, you can go to sacsda.org um, sometime tomorrow afternoon. I'll send it over tonight to Rashad and he will post this for me in the morning. Um, no, don't put your email address in the chat, please. What I need you to do is- to, We don't see yours. Your email uh, didn't show up in the chat either. Oh, okay. Dr. Lashley is saying he saw it. Um, all right, so let me tell you the email address. My email address is eenis.sacsda.org. That's two E's, two N's, is at sacsda.org. E N S at sacsda.org. And the conference website is sacsda.org. That's sacsda.org. And all right, I see some comments in the chat. Very good presentation and timely. I'm glad that you were enriched by this and thank you for your commentary. Uh, any, any questions for me this evening? By the way, if you're asking a question and I'm not answering you, that's because you're on mute. So you might want to unmute yourself if you're trying to speak. I have a comment, um, Pastor. Go thank ahead, please, Doc. Thank you for this very succinct and very, very comprehensive presentation. It's great. I think it's just a matter of getting our teams at churches to practice it and getting the act of doing it. And perhaps I'm trying to think if it's possible to have this this um, presentation that you made, the oral part, sent out to people so they can, at their leisure, also go back and actually study what you just shared orally. Yes. And that's why I uploaded it to the chat and I'll go the extra mile of having it posted on our conference website um, tomorrow morning. I mean your oral presentation, the recorded presentation. Oh, the recorded. Oh, yes. Uh, yes, because I was recording it. Actually, I am recording it. And uh, yes, I would, I would make this available on the conference YouTube channel. I'm That's going it. to have communication posted on the YouTube channel so that you can That's go back and watch. I was sitting there eating biscuit all this time on. <laughs> oh, I'm drinking tea and all of that and I realized. <laughs> oh my God.